All right, so we are going to begin the um, anatomic landmarks and radiographic interpretation portion for the um, radiology board review. Uh, I'm going to move pretty quickly through all of these. Mostly I'm just going to be pointing out where these structures are. Um, this one's going to move a lot faster than the other. Um, simply because, you know, you you can just see it or you don't, you, you know it or you don't. Um, if you want to move a little slower, the other videos that are on the YouTube uh, channel for chapter uh, 27 and 29 from radiology will probably be uh, more helpful for you. So uh, the two types of bone that we deal with in radiology are going to be cortical bone, which is the dense outer layer of bone, and it's going to appear radiopaque or white on the image. Then there is cancellous bone, which is the soft spongy bone located between two layers of dense cortical bone, and it appears primarily radiolucent. However, it has those lacy white or lattice uh, appearance of the trabeculae. Um, which is where the marrow spaces um, and like nerve and blood vessels and things like that travel through. So cortical bone is also referred to as compact bone um, and the inferior border of the mandible is composed of cortical bone but sometimes uh, in boards they will point to nothing like the space in between uh, two teeth and they're you know talking about the um, the cancellous bone, the lattice or lacy appearance of the bone in between. This is what that looks like. So there on the left, you can see the uh, plate, the cortical plate of bone underneath. And then here on the right, you can see this lacy or lattice looking appearance of this bone in between the teeth. Prominences in bone are anything that stick out. Uh, so a process is a marked prominence or projection. Uh, the ridge is going to be a linear prominence or projection. A spine is a sharp thorn-like projection. We see this on the anterior nasal spine. And this image right here actually is one of the best images you can see for uh, the anterior nasal spine. Uh, a tubercle is a small bump or nodule and a tuberosity is a rounded uh, prominence. Spaces and depressions in bone are the canals, which are tube-like passageways through bone that contain nerve and blood vessels. A foramen is an opening or a hole that permits the passage of nerves and blood vessels. The fossa is a broad, shallow, uh, scooped out area or depressed area. Uh, we see this like in this area underneath the teeth here, especially if you feel in your own mouth, you can feel that area underneath uh, the bone, and it is for the uh, submandibular glands, right? Then the sinus is a hollow space or a cavity or a recess of some type. So spaces and depressions in bone do not resist the passage of x-rays um, as much as the areas around them. So on an x-ray, they will appear uh, at least more radiolucent than their surrounding structures. Miscellaneous terms are going to be the septum, which is a bony wall or a partition that divides two spaces or cavities. Most of the time we talk about the nasal septum, which is made up of the nasal bones and the vomer bone, uh, and it's what separates the two cavities of the nasal fossa. And then a suture is going to be an immovable joint representing a line of union between two adjoining bones of the skull. Uh, we, you know, we think of this as like the um, sutures like for, you know, the, the skull bones. But here in this uh, image on the left, we can see the median palatal suture, which is where the two maxillary bones fused together. And most of the time on an x-ray, if you catch it just right at the right angle, you will see a thin radiolucent line. The landmarks we're going to be going over are going to be the incisive foramen, the superior foramina of the incisive canal, the median palatal suture, lateral fossa, nasal cavity, nasal septum, floor of the nasal cavity, and anterior nasal spine. 
uh, we're going to discuss where these are located and how they appear on the image. This image right here is showing us the lateral fossa. All of these arrows are pointing at them. Sometimes this area is also called the canine fossa, and it's called one or the other because it always is between the lateral and the canine. We'll also talk about the inferior nasal concha, the maxillary sinus, which have septa within them, right? The plural version of septum is septa. The nutrient canals within the maxillary sinus, the inverted Y, which is a board favorite, the maxillary tuberosity, hamulus, zygomatic process of the maxilla, and the zygoma. We're going to be talking about each of them. All right, so first up is the incisive foramen, or it's sometimes called the nasopalatine foramen. And it is an opening or a hole in the bone that's located at the midline of the anterior portion of the hard palate, directly posterior to the maxillary central incisors. If you are feeling in your mouth, the incisive papilla, right in between eight and nine on the lingual side, cover the incisive foramen. The appearance on a radiograph is gonna be a small ovoid or round radiolucent, which means dark area, located between the roots of the maxillary central incisors. So the, the sort of rounded part here is the incisive foramen. This line right here is the medial palatal suture, or median palatal suture. Superior foramina of the incisive canal. So uh, above the incisive foramen, there are two little canals that actually travel up from underneath, uh, or um, I guess things travel from above to, to down, but they are two tiny openings or holes in the bone that are located on the floor of the nasal cavity, and they join together to form the incisive canal. And so this little space here is what this looks like. It kind of has these two little areas. These little spaces here are what they're talking about, the superior foramina. So it looks like this um, on the top here of these things. Um, they will be two small round radiolucencies right above the anterior nasal spine. So when you're looking at the anterior nasal spine and you're seeing this sort of uh, duck foot structure, the uh, two radiolucencies right here in between the feet of the duck are going to be the superior foramina. Median palatal suture, which I've already been talking about, but it's this dark line right here. It is an immovable joint between the two palatine processes of the maxilla. It's the two maxillary bones fused together here. Uh, the radio the appearance is going to be a radiolucent line between the maxillary central incisors. If you catch it just right, you won't always get it right in the right angle to be able to see it so clearly like this. Uh, the palatal processes, the palatine processes form the major portion of the hard palate. So these two areas is the hard palate where it joins together in the center. The soft tissue structure that goes along with this is going to be um, the median palatal uh, ridge, right? Um, or median palatal raffae, sorry. The median palatal suture will extend from the alveolar bone between the maxillary central incisors to the posterior hard palate. The lateral fossa, which is sometimes known as the canine fossa because it appears between the two structures, is a smooth, depressed area of the maxilla located just inferior and medial to the infraorbital foramen between the canine and the lateral incisors. If you feel on your own face just below uh, the ala of your nose, you can feel that sort of depression right underneath it and that is the lateral fossa. Uh, the appearance on a radiograph is a radiolucent area, or dark, between the canine and the lateral incisors. The nasal cavity is always going to be a pear-shaped compartment of bone located superior to the maxilla. Uh, it is the inferior portion is going to be formed by the palatal processes of the maxilla and the horizontal portions of the palatine bones. Essentially, it's the floor of the nasal cavity, which of course is, is, is the maxilla. Um, a large radiolucent area above the maxillary incisors. So here, um, this 
dark area here, this is the nasal cavity, right? So then this line right here is the floor of the nasal cavity. And then this line right here is the anterior nasal spine. And this line right here is the soft tissue line of the nose. It's also, uh, the nasal cavity is also known as the nasal fossa. The lateral walls of the nasal cavity are formed by the ethmoid bone and the maxilla. And the nasal cavity is divided by the nasal septum. Then the nasal septum is the bony uh, vertical wall or partition that divides the nasal cavity into the right and left nasal fossa. It's formed by the vomer bone and a portion of the ethmoid bone and cartilage and the, and the nasal bones at the top. Um, the appearance is going to be a vertical radiopaque partition that divides the nasal cavity. And then there is the floor of the nasal cavity. This is a bony wall formed by the palatal processes of the maxilla and the horizontal portions of the palatine bones. The appearance here is a dense radiopaque band of bone above the maxillary incisors. It's the bottom of the nasal cavity. So the floor is composed of dense cortical bone and defines the inferior border or the bottom border of the nasal cavity. Moving to the anterior nasal spine, it's called the nasal spine because it is a thorn-like projection. It is a sharp projection of the maxilla located at the anterior and inferior portion of the nasal cavity. It is this thing right here. I think it looks like a duck foot, but I guess that's just me. Um, so this little area here and this one right here are those uh, superior um, foramina of the incisive canal, right? Um, and then here above this as well, you can see the nasal fossa. And this one right here in the center is the nasal septum. For the anterior nasal spine, it is a V-shaped radiopaque area located at the intersection of the floor of the nasal cavity and the nasal septum. The inferior nasal concha, these are wafer thin curved plates of bone that extend from the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. Concha actually means shell shaped or scroll shaped because it is a piece of bone that kind of curls and then it, it sort of curls in around itself to create more of a surface area. However, on an x-ray, it just looks like a blurry little blob right there inside the nose on like the lateral sides. The maxillary sinus. So uh, this is a description as the paired cavities or compartments of bone located within the maxilla and they are located above the maxillary premolar and molar teeth. The appearance is going to be a radiolucent area located above the apices of the premolars and molars. So all of this dark area up here, this is all the maxillary sinus. All of these arrows right here pointing at this sort of radio uh, peak line, that is the floor of the maxillary sinus. Um, when people are born, their maxillary sinus is actually only the size of a small pea, uh, but then as they get older, it grows. Um, and if you're someone who's prone to sinus uh, congestion and sinus infections, yours is probably a little bit bigger. Um, maxillary sinus is, compro is composed of dense cortical bone along the edge. Septa within the maxillary sinus, so there are bony walls or partitions that appear to divide this maxillary sinus into compartments. Uh, it, all, of the, all of the septa are going to be radiopaque lines that are within the maxillary sinus, but don't get it confused with like the you know, edge of the, the nasal fossa. Like the nasal fossa is its own cavity, okay? It's not the part of the maxillary sinus. Um, and the septa, like the presence and the number of them, vary depending on the individual. Septa, the word septa is also the plural form of the word septum, but they both mean bony walls or partitions. Nutrient canals, so sometimes you'll see tiny tube-like passageways that travel sort of through the uh, maxillary sinus, and these are nutrient canals that are supplying blood and tissue and nerve to the teeth. 
they are going to be a narrow radiolucent band bounded by two very thin radiopaque lines. Uh, they supply the maxillary teeth and the interdental areas with uh, blood and nutrients, and the radiopaque lines represent the cortical bone that makes up the wall of the canal. The inverted Y is another um, board favorite, and the, it is the intersection of the maxillary sinus and the nasal cavity. I just said don't get this part confused with the maxillary septa, right? Those are different. This part where the nasal cavity and the maxillary sinus meet, you see this upside down Y right here, okay? Um, and it's formed from the intersection of those two. It's always located above the maxillary canine. So you, you won't see this anywhere else, uh, but odds are you will see this question on your board. Maxillary tuberosity. So this little section right here back behind the most distal maxillary tooth, uh, is a rounded prominence in bone, and it's going to look like a radiopaque sort of bulge that's distal to the third molar region. Uh, blood vessels and nerves enter the maxilla in this area, and they supply those posterior teeth. So it's sort of just like the last little bit of alveolar bone uh, in the ridge. And then right behind it, we saw we could see it on the last slide, but this little part right behind the maxillary uh, tuberosity is the hamulus. It is a small hook-like projection of bone extending from the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. Okay, so the sphenoid bone is just behind the maxillary uh, bones and palatal bones, and so that little projection is the medial part of it. It is a radiopaque hook-like projection posterior to the maxillary tuberosity. Uh, in some cases, like in some books and, and you know, certain um, uh, written word on it is going to call it the hamular process. Um, and it's, I mean, it's either one, the hamulus or the hamular process. Zygomatic process of the maxilla. So the um, bony projection of the maxilla that is going to kind of reach out to touch the zygoma, or the zygoma is also called the malar bone. Um, this, it, it's always like a J or a U shape right here above these maxillary molars. Um, yeah. The zygoma is the area like right here. This is the zygomatic process of the maxillary bone. But this section right here behind it, this is where the zygoma attaches to that maxillary process and, or the zygomatic process. And this is the cheekbone. Moving on to the mandible. The mandible is the largest and strongest bone of the face. Uh, and it's actually one of the few that's not like a paired bone. It is one, it, it's its own bone. Um, and it is divided into three main parts. So is there is the ramus, which is the vertical portion found posterior to the third molar. The body is the horizontal U-shape portion from ramus to ramus, but not including the area around the teeth. And then it is then the third part is the alveolar process, which is the part up by the teeth. Um, so what we're looking at here in this image is both the body and the alveolar process. Also, the, the mandible is the only movable uh, bone of the, the face. So the genial tubercles are going, the bony landmarks we're going to be talking about, and we're going to look at where they are, is uh, genial tubercles, lingual foramen, nutrient canals, mental ridge, mental fossa, mental foramen. And continuing, we're going to talk about these and we're going to look at that at them, is the mandibular canal, mylohyoid ridge, external oblique ridge, anterior border of the ramus, submandibular fossa, and coronoid process. First up is the genial tubercles. I think of them as like uh, genial, also means happy. And then um, I don't know why, but tubercles makes me think of like um, surfers. Anyway, they're like these little happy surfers hanging out around the lingual, um, the lingual foramen. It doesn't say lingual foramen, I figured it would, but it says they're the tiny bumps of bone on the lingual aspect of the mandible. They are the attachment sites for the genioglossus and the geniohyoid muscles. 
Um, they are a ring-shaped radiopacity below the apices of the mandibular incisors. You'll always see them right in the center below the two centrals. Uh, I figured they would have said lingual foramen on the last slide because the little dot right in the center here, this little dot is the lingual foramen. It is surrounded by the genial tubercles. And the, um, well, the lingual foramen is the tiny opening or hole in the bone um, on the, you know, directly below the central incisors. And it is going to be a radiolucent dot. Um, these nutrient canals, you can see them sometimes if you catch just the right angle. They are tube-like passageways through bone that contain nerve and blood vessels that supply the teeth. Most often they're seen um, in the anterior sections, they're not, not as often in the back. Um, and then also they're seen more once a tooth has been pulled, uh, if it's no longer there as that like blood and tissue kind of slowly start to you know go away. Um, you'll start to see the nutrient canals more. You can see this one right here too pretty pretty well on this um, image. So the appearance here is a vertical radiolucent line uh, kind of connecting the you know uh, mandibular or mental canal to the uh, apice of the tooth. Mental ridge. So this is a prominence um, well, it's a linear prominence of cortical bone located on the external surface of the anterior portion of the mandible. This is the part uh, of your chin, like the part that sticks out. That's the mental ridge. So you can feel it on your own face underneath the soft tissue. It is a thick radiopaque band that extends from the premolar region to the incisor region often appears superimposed over the mandibular anterior teeth like we see in this one. Although with this one, uh, because we can see this, you know, posterior or the, the inferior border here, um, we have a little bit of like a excessive vertical angulation on this um, x-ray here. Um, the mental ridge extends from the premolar ridge to the midline and it's going to slope slightly upward because that's the shape of your chin. The mental fossa is going to be this scooped out depressed area located on the external surface of the anterior mandible. It's a radiolucent area above the mental ridge. So you have your chin kind of at the bottom of the front of your jaw. And then right above that, there's a little area that's sort of scooped out. That is the mental fossa. The mental foramen, this one is bored, happy question. Okay, I, I cannot tell you enough. You will, you will probably see this one. Um, the mental foramen is an opening or a hole in bone located on the external surface of the mandible in the region of the mandibular premolars. The appearance is going to be a small ovoid or round radiolucent area located in the apical region of the mandibular premolars. Don't get this thing confused with a periapical abscess, okay? It's not an abscess. The mandibular canal is a tube-like passageway through bone that travels the length of the mandible. So it comes on, it, you know, it like starts way back here, uh, back here at the ramus, and it travels underneath the alveolar ridge and supplies all of the blood and, and nerve endings that the mandibular teeth need. Um, so it houses the inferior alveolar nerve, or the IA. The appearance is going to be a radiolucent band outlined by two thin radiopaque lines that represent the cortical walls. So this, you'll always see these two little thin white lines that always border the um, mandibular canal. And the mylohyoid ridge, this one is also uh, called the internal oblique ridge, um, and it is a linear prominence of bone located on the internal surface of the mandible. So if with your tongue you go over to your uh, molars and you go straight down, right above the submandibular fossa on that bone, you'll feel that linear ridge, and it's going to travel all the way up by your premolars, okay? That is your mylohyoid ridge. 
and it's a dense radiopaque band that extends downward and forward from the molar region. Then there is the external oblique ridge, and this is a linear prominence of bone located on the external surface of the body of the mandible. So it is a radiopaque band extending downward and forward from the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. You'll always see the external oblique ridge. One, it will always be higher, right? So if I saw both of the external and the internal or mylohyoid ridge, I would see the internal one down here and I would see external above, okay? Um, so this external one's always going to start way back here, back here in the ramus, and it's going to stop right about the second molar here. The, ex the internal oblique ridge always kind of starts here by the second molar and travels down toward the uh, premolar area. Anterior border of the ramus, so this one right here is the external oblique ridge this guy. But this line right here where all these arrows are pointing, that is the anterior border of the ramus. It extends vertically downward from the coronoid process, which if we were to keep going straight up, right, the coronoid process would probably look something like this, and then there would be the sigmoid notch, and there would be the condyle, and then the whole thing would kind of come back down and travel along here. Um, on a molar bite wing image, the the descending ramus of the mandible may be seen as a slightly radiopaque vertical band posterior to the maxillary and mandibular molars. Submandibular fossa. So below the mylohyoid ridge or the um, internal oblique ridge, there is a scooped out depressed area of bone located on the internal surface of the mandible inferior to the mylohyoid ridge, right? If you go down in there, you can feel it. That is where your submandibular glands all are. It is a radiolucent area in the molar region below the mylohyoid ridge. Most of the time when you're looking at it, you might get this line right here for the mylohyoid ridge kind of mixed up with the mandibular canal. But with the mandibular canal, remember, you have to have both lines. Okay, you'll see it will be a dark area in between two radiopaque lines, whereas with the submandibular fossa, we're talking about this whole area here, and it's just this one radiopaque line, okay? Coronoid process. Uh, this isn't something you see too terribly often on an intraoral image. Every so often you will. It is a marked prominence of bone and is on the anterior ramus of the mandible. It has a radiopaque sort of triangular shape superimposed over or inferior to the maxillary tuberosity region. To be able to get this image, you would have had your patient open really big and they're probably still opening. So when I see this image, I kind of think that um, somebody probably had their patient stay open and they're holding that film, <laughs> which you shouldn't do. Um, so it's this front of the, the um, ramus right here in the front coronoid process. All right, moving on to tooth structure. So we're looking at the enamel, which is the outermost radiopaque border, uh, radiopaque layer of the crown of the tooth. Inside that is the dentin. And then where the dentin uh, meets the enamel is the dentino enamel junction or the DEJ. And then there, inside that is the pulp cavity or the pulp chamber where the pulp or the nerve and the blood vessels and everything good uh, alive still lives inside that tooth. The anatomy of the alveolar bone. So around the uh, teeth, there is the PDL, right? There's the cementum layer, and then there is the PDL, which is a radiolucent um, line surrounding the tooth. And then on the outside of that is the lamina dura, which Lamina dura literally means um, hard layer. It's a hard layer of bone um, that completely surrounds the alveoli of these teeth. And this layer of bone is lamina dura, okay? Um, 
but the shape and the density of the alveolar bone is going to be different. In the anterior portions, um, you're going to see kind of more of a pointed sort of shape of the crestal bone. And then in the posterior sections, you're going to see more of that like kind of horizontal uh, line. It doesn't mean that the that they've lost horizontal or crestal bone in the posterior sections. It's just shaped a little different. Uh, the anatomic landmarks of the alveolar process include the lamina dura, the alveolar crest, and the periodontal ligament space. The lamina dura is the wall of the tooth socket. It's made of dense cortical bone. It's going to appear as a radiopaque line that supports or surrounds the tooth, uh, the root of the tooth. The alveolar crest is the most coronal portion of the alveolar bone found between the teeth. Typically, uh, one and a half to two millimeters below the cemento enamel junction. So I always look for where does the enamel end and how far away from there is the crestal bone. Periodontal ligament space is the space between the root of the tooth and the lamina dura. It is a thin radiolucent line around the tooth the root of a tooth. Why is that hard? so hard for me to say? Um, but you can see it really nicely, although there's like so many arrows in this one. Like So this very thin radiopaque line surrounding this tooth here, I can't really see it in this section, but I can see it pick it up right here and here it is right there. All of that lamb or I'm sorry, PDL space. I think I was I was looking at the lamina dura here. They're talking about the dark line on the inside of the lamina dura. Shape and density. So in the anterior regions, a normal alveolar crest will appear pointed and sharp in between the teeth. And in the posterior sections, the uh, crestal bone or the alveolar crest will have more of a flat and smooth appearance in between the teeth. Moving on to the primary dentition. So here we can see that these are the baby teeth um, or the dentigerous teeth. In mixed dentition, we see between the ages of six and 12, mixed dentition means they have both uh, some primary and some permanent teeth seen in the oral cavity. And uh, it can produce a variety of dental concerns depending on you know, the overall growth and development of the individual. Um, so therefore, for radiographs, you're probably taking some kind of combination of periapical, bite wing, and occlusal images that you use to determine, you know, does the patient have all of the teeth that they're supposed to have. Normal anatomy on panoramic images. So some of those landmarks that we might see. Number one right here is going to be the mastoid process. Number two, you can see just behind the ramus of the mandible is going to be the styloid process. Number three right here is this opening in bone right behind the mandibular condyle, and that one is going to be the external auditory meatus. Number four right here above the uh, condyle is going to be the glenoid fossa. This is the part right behind the articular eminence, number five is the articular eminence, by the way, that is where the condyle sits when the patient is closed. Uh, number six is going to be the lateral pterygoid plate, and you'll always see it kind of superimposed or under, I guess, uh, superimposed with the um, coronoid process kind of area uh, and the maxillary tuberosity and all of that kind of stuff is all sort of layered on top of each other. Number seven is the pterygo maxillary fissure. Let me find number seven. It should be like, oh, I just covered it up right here. This is number seven. So this line right here is the pterygo mandibular um, fissure. Number eight is the maxillary tuberosity right behind the uh, last or most distal maxillary molar. Number nine is the infraorbital foramen. Uh, so on a panoramic, you'll probably see that inside the maxillary sinus. Number 10 is going to be the orbit. Uh, and so you'll see the infraorbital um, sort of line or the floor of the orbit. 
Number 11 is the incisive canal. So uh, we can see the sort of lines traveling from um, the superior foramina down to the incisive papilla. Number 12 is the incisive foramen right here in the center. 13 is the anterior nasal spine. So right above the um, incisive papilla, uh, or I'm sorry, the incisive foramen, you'll see the sort of triangular radio opacity. Number 14 is the nasal fossa or the nasal concha uh, inside the nasal cavity. So here we can see these nasal or inferior nasal concha and they're inside this nasal uh, fossa. And then six, 15, I'm sorry, I'm getting my numbers off. 15 right here is the nasal septum. Number 16 over here uh, is going to be the hard palate. Just because the number is here doesn't mean that that's the only place they put the number, but this entire structure here that's usually like a big white sort of section is the hard palate. Number 17, oh here it is. This is going to be the maxillary sinus. They're talking about like all this blue area. Number 18 is the floor of the maxillary sinus. So, you know, if the, if the x-rays are um, if the arrows are pointing at the radio opaque line at the bottom of the maxillary sinus, they, they're probably talking about the floor of the maxillary sinus versus like if their arrow is kind of sitting in the middle of the maxillary sinus, usually then they, they're talking about the actual cavity. Uh, number 18, oh, I'm sorry, 18 was the floor of the maxillary sinus, so 19 is the zygomatic process of the maxilla. Um, and so this is on a panoramic, it's a lot less defined. It's not that UJ shape that you're normally looking at. It's kind of just this whitish area um, that's less radiopaque than the um, zygomatic arch, which is always 20 right here. Uh, this structure will always be superimposed with the articular eminence and the glenoid fossa, okay? So sometimes you're gonna have to use context clues to figure out what it is they're asking for because the articular eminence and glenoid fossa are right there on top of the, um, the zygomatic process of the maxilla and the zygoma. Um, also, you wanna be paying attention to that they're not talking about the coronoid uh, process here. Um, in the front, and they're not talking about the condyle back there on the back. Um, number 21, again, right behind the maxillary tuberosity is going to be the hamulus. Bony landmarks of the mandible. So number one is the condyle, that one's over here. Number two is the sigmoid notch. You'll also see it referred to as the mandibular notch. Uh, number three is the coronoid process, and it's always going to look in this like triangular sort of uh, shape. Number four is the mandibular uh, foramen, or the area where the mandibular canal begins. Number five is the lingula. Uh, it's kind of just this area right above the, um, the mandibular canal. Number six is the mandibular uh, canal, which, yeah, it travels down. Number seven, this one is the mental foramen. You'll always see it kind of down just below these two uh, premolars. Number eight, see if I can find it, is the, um, where is number eight? Oh, down here, number eight, is the hyoid bone, sorry, it took me a minute. Uh, number nine is the mental ridge. So we'll always see the mental ridge uh, is kind of this like upside down U sort of shape. Number 10 is the mental fossa. So it's always gonna look like this kind of darkish blob right above the mental uh, ridge. Number 11 is going to be the lingual foramen right here in the middle, whereas number 12, they're talking about the genial tubercles surrounding the lingual foramen. 
Number 13 is the inferior border of the mandible. Fifth, I'm sorry, 14 is going to be the uh, internal oblique ridge, which is this line right here as it travels forward. Um, number 15 is the external oblique ridge. Um, 14 as well, I'm sorry, that one is the internal oblique ridge, but it's also called the mylohyoid ridge, okay? Number 16 is the external oblique ridge. Hold on. Oh, okay, so 14 and 15, this whole little section right here, this is both of these things. I, I promise you, sometimes they say that they're separate structures, like in this image here, but they're not separate structures. It's the same thing. Um, 16 is the external oblique ridge. Okay, so air spaces. Air spaces seen on panoramics. This one's probably the words that are the most daunting, but number one up here is going to be the palatoglossal. So if you think of it like right below the hard palate and above the, like it's, it's basically formed by the tongue in there, it's the soft tissue structures. Um, so right below the hard palate that you see on the panoramic is going to be the palatoglossal airspace. Number two is the uh, nasopharyngeal. So once you kind of pass this line, right, everything from here backward is going to be pharyngeal. Everything from, you know, that line forward, think of it as palato or glossal, okay? Um, so number two here above by the condyle, that one is going to be the nasopharyngeal airspace, right? Because this is the cavity that travels all the way up and allows us to breathe through our nose. And then number three is going to be the glossopharyngeal. So this is like the tongue in the back of your throat that you, you know, like you have them push their tongue to the roof of their mouth, but they're, you know, there's still soft tissue there. So um, this is the glosso or tongue pharynx uh, airspace, which airspaces are kind of just soft tissue areas. More soft tissue that we see uh, on the panoramic. So number one, this area right here is going to be the tongue. So as an airspace, this right here is the uh, palatoglossal airspace, right? Uh, number two is the soft palate and the uvula. So here, usually we see the beginning of the nasopalatine, uh, I'm sorry, nasopharyngeal airspace. There, number two is the soft palate and uvula. Number three, this line right here is always gonna be the lip line. If you forget to tell your patient to close their lips and put their tongue to the roof of their mouth, it's going to completely black out all of these teeth here. Uh, and number four is the ear. I think it's always pretty easy to see the ear on a, on a panoramic. Um, so here's more structures. Number one is the external auditory meatus. You can see that little opening in the bone there. Number two is the pterygomaxillary fissure. It's always gonna look like this sort of upside down teardrop shaped area. Uh, number three is the infraorbital foramen. Um, so you can see that kind of small little opening or hole at the bottom of the orbit. Um, number four is pointing to this space up here. That is the orbit. Five is pointing at the anterior nasal spine, right? It has like that duck shape sort of thing here. Uh, number six is the nasal septum. So we see this sort of uh, bony partition or bony wall right in the center of the nose. Number seven is the nasal concha. So you can see this sort of like blob, like looking thing right here in the middle of the nose, kind of on the lateral side. Number eight always is going to be uh, this hard palate structure as it comes across. Number nine, uh, so we sort of talked about it, but sort of this shape right here plus all of this is going to be the, um, so this shape here is the zygomatic process and then this sort of line here is the zygoma. On someone who has no teeth, um, here number one, we see that where the condyle sits, that is the glenoid fossa uh, of the temporal bone. 
Number two, this little protuberance right in front of the glenoid fossa, that is the articular eminence. Number three, they're pointing at the maxillary tuberosity, even though the patient doesn't have a distal molar to be more distal than, it is the, the sort of back edge of the alveolar ridge. Uh, number four, they are pointing at the maxillary sinus right here. And number five, this one, I, gosh, I don't even know how you'd probably get it, but you can see this sort of J shape right here. And then this little, so this is the maxillary sinus porta, sort of section. This is the zygomatic process. And then this line right here is the zygoma. The only reason I know that though is because they gave me the answer. You'd probably have to use context clues to find it. Number one here is going to be the condyle of the mandible. Number two, they're talking about the sigmoid notch or the mandibular notch. Number three, they're pointing at the coronoid process. Number four, they are talking about the mandibular foramen. You can see the tiny opening and then right here, can you see how the mandibular canal starts? So if the arrow points just above where the mandibular canal starts, they're talking about the mandibular foramen. Number five down here, uh, as always, anytime they can find it on a pano, they're going to, it's going to be the mental foramen. Number six, um, so they're probably going to give you some type of context clues as far as if it's radiopaque or radiolucent or kind of what they mean here. But number six in this image is going to be the genial tubercles surrounding the lingual foramen. And number seven uh, is the styloid process. So because you can see how long it is, right? It's the styloid process. This is different from the hamulus, which I don't even think we can really see the hamulus very well. Uh, I mean, maybe this little thing right here, um, although that's, that's a stretch. I don't necessarily think we have the angle for the hamulus. Number one, uh, they're talking about this little line right here, which is followed by the little line right above it, which is the mandibular canal. Number two, that's down here. You can see the hyoid uh, bone, only bone in your body that's not um, connected to another bone. Number three uh, is this line right here. Um, so they're talking about the internal oblique ridge. Well, yes, this right here is the external oblique ridge uh, because it sort of stops right here. And then here it starts um, just below and then it comes down forward. Um, that is the internal oblique ridge. So here, if I were gonna separate it on the opposite side, this part right here is the external oblique ridge. But then from right here down to here, that is the internal oblique ridge. And then number four, where's number four? Oh, here. So this is the angle of the mandible. Air spaces seen on a real panoramic. Uh, so number one, okay, that's this one right here, we can see is the palatoglossal. This part right here, that is the palate, the hard palate on this image. And so the airspace right below the palate is going to be the palatoglossal. It's, you know, sort of made with the tongue. And then number two, where's the image? Here it is. So number two is this airspace right here that is above uh, the condyle. And so it is going to be the nasopharyngeal because it connects over to this nasal uh, area here. And then three, here is the number. And this one is going to be the glossopharyngeal. This is where the tongue sits in the back of the throat. Soft tissues. Um, I think this is number one right here, although it kind of looked like a seven for a minute. This one is going to be the tongue space right here. And so if you see this sort of dark line right here, uh, you're probably seeing the tongue. Number two is the soft palate or the uvula right here. Number three, oh, here it is. So this part right here is the ear. And then that's the end of this. Um, there's the key for that one. Uh, that one is in your book too. Um, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. Okay, so radiographic interpretation. We're gonna start looking at what we're actually looking at on these x-rays besides the normal anatomy. 
so identification of restorations, we're going to go through each one of these. Uh, these are all the common restorative materials, and we can identify each of them for certain reasons on our x-rays. Uh, so first is metallic restorations. Um, they absorb x-rays really, really well. X-rays have a very hard time penetrating through anything metal, and so very little radiation ever goes through all the way to the receptor. The metal stops them. That is why that area of the receptor remains unexposed and the metallic restoration um, appear completely radiopaque or they look bright white. Uh, so amalgam and gold will appear very, very light or completely bright white on a dental image. Uh, Non-metallic restorations will vary in appearance because um, it's gonna depend on how dense the material is. So porcelain is gonna be the most dense and therefore the least radiolucent, or they should have said most dense and most radiopaque, right? The acrylic is going to be the least dense, excuse me, and the most radiolucent. Uh, moving on to amalgam restorations. So these are metallic. They're going to show up very bright white. Um, you can have one surface amalgam restorations or more surfaces. It isn't just you know, just the one. Uh, we're gonna look at amalgam overhangs and we're gonna look at amalgam fragments. At one point in time, amalgam was the most common restorative uh, material that was used in dentistry. They felt like it was the most compatible with the tooth and um, it was a, it's, it is still today a good restorative material. It's just not used as much because it's not as like aesthetically pleasing. Uh, so a one surface amalgam restoration is going to look like this image here on the far left and then the image in the middle. That is what a one surface amalgam restoration is going to look like. And it's going to appear distinct, small, round, or ovoid uh, radial opacity, so super bright white. It can be seen on the buccal, lingual, or occlusal surfaces. I know I still have a like a buccal pit amalgam from when I was like six years old. Um, larger two-surface and multi-surface amalgam restorations are also going to be very, very radiopaque and are going to be characterized by their very irregular outlines or borders because it looks like, um, you know, like a, a two-year-old drew, a, tried to draw a straight line here. Um, that is the difference between amalgam and, and most of the other surface, or the, a crown, basically. Amalgam overhangs are going to be the extension of amalgam seen beyond the crown portion of the tooth in the interproximal region. The problem is that it disturbs the natural cleansing contour of the tooth. It's going to trap food and plaque and it's going to contribute to bone loss in that area. This is what that looks like. So when they placed the amalgam, instead of having the wedge fill in this space and have the matrix keep it nice and like hugged and contoured with the tooth, they didn't. And so this area looks like this. On the left here, we're seeing this amalgam overhang here. We're not talking about all of this wonderful calculus right here. Amalgam fragments. So this is what happens if, uh, you know, they are removing amalgam and they have to, you know, clean it out with a burr. It's going to kind of turn the amalgam into a dust. Um, and that a dust can become embedded in the soft tissue. Um, and so it's going to appear as dense radiopacities with very irregular borders. You're going to look like it, like almost like it's a little sparkly right there on the x-ray. Um, soft tissue wise, it's gonna look like this, where it leaves this sort of color or hue to the tissue. Uh, it's very different from like melanin pigmentation, uh, but you'll see it like as uh, sort of a purple or a blue color. And on an x-ray, it looks like this. Gold restorations will uh, look completely radiopaque and unlike amalgam restorations, they usually have a smooth marginal outline. Uh, you know, gold is something that they used a lot of care when they were replacing. Uh, gold crowns and bridges will have large radiopaque restorations with very smooth contours and irregular, I'm sorry, and regular borders. Um, and a gold foil restoration, typically they did that on very small uh, cavities. Gold was a really great restorative material because it is a softer metal and so it's more malleable and it is, you know, nicer in the oral cavity, but uh, it's pretty expensive, so 
that's why they don't use it for everything. And that's what those look like. Um, if you'll look at this image, it's almost impossible for you to tell the difference between um, a gold sort of restoration uh, and an amalgam restoration just from looking at the x-ray, right? It's almost impossible. Um, so with this, you have to look inside the person's mouth. Stainless steel and chrome crowns. So these are usually prefabricated and, uh, you know, most of the time they do them at pediatric offices, um, but they will uh, have them sort of waiting in queue until the kid comes in and needs it, and then they will place it over the tooth um, in order to give it more, um, you know, support, and it helps to prevent cavity from spreading, but it's not ideal, and it's not meant to live there forever. Um, the stainless steel, you can tell it's stainless steel on the x-ray because you'll always see sort of like this edge right here uh, almost like you can kind of see through the crown for post and core you can see that they did a uh, root canal down here and then there was so much of the tooth structure missing that they actually placed like a post down into the root canal or into the canal of the tooth and it is going to help support the crown once they put it on top and it looks like that Porcelain restorations, so these will have the appearance of porcelain, um, is going to be slightly more radiopaque um, and is going to resemble the radiopacity of dentin. Uh, so it's kind of hard to tell. Usually, though, you're going to see a thin radiopaque line outlining the prepared tooth that represents the cement that got used to, you know, attach the porcelain crown. Um, in a porcelain fused to metal, though, it's going to look like a metal crown, except it's going to have kind of this sort of less dark or less bright white section around it. So um, here, this is what it looks like for full porcelain crowns. You can see it almost looks like dentin, right? And then there's this like perfect little line. That is the cement. Uh, whereas here, you can see this image right here, that is a porcelain fused to metal. You can see the bright white of the metal, and then the porcelain is just baked on to the outside of it. Composite restoration, so this really varies depending on the type of material that the dentist was using. Typically, uh, today they're using the more dense uh, composite material because they want it to last a little bit longer, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean always they're using that type of material. Uh, this one is because you, you can see how it's like this perfect margin. That's how you're probably able to tell the difference between a cavity and this composite restoration. The other way to tell the difference is going to be to look in their mouth. Um, I just want to point out that this is an excellent x-ray for being able to see the mental fossa right above the mental uh, ridge. Acrylic restorations, these are often used as an interim or a temporary crown or filling. Um, so the, they prep the crown, uh, the tooth for a crown, they send the, the impression off to a lab, and they will make them an acrylic crown for the tooth until the crown comes back from the lab. Um, so we're going to talk about the different types of materials used in these different types of, of uh, dentistry. So materials used in restorative are going to be base materials uh, like cavity liners. Um, and sometimes you can see it kind of underneath the restoration. Sometimes it'll appear more radiopaque or sometimes it'll appear less radiopaque than the restorative material. It just depends on what kind of material they used. Uh, and then metallic pins. So these are typically used when you do a crown or a very large filling um, in order to kind of enhance the retention is what it says, but to keep the filling material on there longer. Um, so this is kind of what that looks like. You can see here, I guess this is trying to show you that they used a, a material underneath the amalgam there. Um, this one is a metallic retention pen. And then here as well, we see those retention pins. Uh, used in endodontics, so we see that they used gutta percha, which is sort of clay-like in order to fill those uh, pulp cavities. 
They used to use silver points, but they don't use these anymore. Um, but they they did exist, um, and so you could possibly see them in root canals that were done um, years ago, although they failed a lot more often than gutta percha did, so you may or may not still see them. Um, prostodontics, so patients um, who get complete dentures, if you forget to take the dentures out before you take your x-rays, it's gonna look like you have these teeth that are just sort of floating in space. Um, and you're also gonna want to remove partials before you take them because it's gonna look like you have like a couple of teeth floating and then this sort of uh, claw looking uh, shape on a tooth where the, um, the clasp is. Uh, this is what that looks like. You have the uh, floating teeth right there on top. And then this is what a sort of metal-based um, denture would look like. This is what ortho brackets look like uh, for braces. They have a very specific, uh, unique look to them. In oral surgery, so implants are being used with increased frequency um, and the shape just depends on what kind of implant they used and like what they're trying to replace the, the tooth of. Uh, but we also see things like suture wires, metallic splints and plates, bone screws, and stabilizing arches for people who had either like fractures to their jaws or if they had like uh, oral surgery where they had to like have their jaw repositioned somehow, then um, we'll see things like that. That is what an implant looks like without the abutment. That's just the implant body on the left. And then on the right, it has the implant uh, body, the abutment, and the crown there. Um, and then here you can see it kind of has those like mesh and screw uh, materials kind of holding, holding everything together inside that person's face. And then here's another one. They probably had some type of fracture and so they have uh, an well, an implanted device, but it's, it's considered a plate that is holding certain sections of that bone together. Um, and then you can identify objects. So depending on if you have the patient take off these things, you, you want to ask them to remove all of their jewelry, necklaces, nose jewelry, eyeglasses. Uh, they shouldn't still wear the bib clip um, and any hearing aids for sure before they get uh, a panoramic or a cephalometric or anything like that. Um, obviously you can't ask them to, to remove shrapnel. That's a bit, of a, a bit of a reach. So this is what that jewelry would look like. Um, so you can see that in some instances, the jewelry is showing up where it is supposed to. But then here you can see that, oh, it looks like this one is a little odd. And then you have like this weirdness happening here, right? That is a ghost image and it obscures certain areas of the image and so it your the image is not diagnostic but also um you know that it's you can't see anything underneath it other miscellaneous objects are going to be uh, having the patient not take their glasses off i try to have my patient walk all the way to the panoramic machine and then i just make them hold their glasses in their hand while i take the x-ray and then they can put them back on uh, the napkin chains, they used to use a chain. Nowadays, I feel like everyone's using like the plastic with the little clips on the end, uh, but like just take it off, it's not a big deal. Uh, hearing aids, if they have any metal components, they should be removed. Um, and then something else you might see is gonna be like shrapnel or any metal fragments um, that scatter outward. Like uh, if you know if they're, your patient's from like Vietnam or, or was hit by an ID or anything like that, then you might be able to see that on an X-ray. Uh, some more miscellaneous objects. So here we can see this patient's glasses here uh, on this x-ray, and then this one is clearly a nose ring. All right, moving on to cavities and what those look like on the x-ray. Uh, so cavities or the description of caries is gonna be localized destruction of the teeth by microorganisms. In an x-ray, uh, the carious area is going to appear more radiolucent because it's going to have a decreased density. The bacteria will break down the, or it will demineralize that area. So it's going to become less dense. The bite wing provides the best image for the dental professional with the greatest amount of diagnostic information. And a periapical uh, exposure taken with the paralleling technique can also be 
interpretation of tips. Um, so making sure that all of your x-rays are mounted properly before you start trying to interpret your images uh, is pretty important. That way you're not saying they need a filling on 18 when really they needed it on 31. That's, that's a big deal. Um, viewing it in a room that has subdued light that is free of distractions. So, I mean, well, technically, yes, you want to look at the x-rays right in front of the patient. That way they have a chance to ask questions. Sometimes it's a good idea to look at the x-rays in a different room to like see what's going on overall and then walk in and make sure to click through them with the patient so they can ask questions um, and so you can explain things to them. But if they're talking to you the whole time you're looking at them, there's a good chance you'll miss something. Um, an illuminator or a view box if you're using traditional film. A masking light around the mounted films, although that's, that's with film. Um, and a pocket-sized magnifying glass, again, if you're using film. If you're using digital, obviously you just enlarge the image. Uh, factors influencing Carrie's interpretation. So how diagnostic your images are. If you have a lot of overlap, which we see in these images, you're not going to be able to tell whether there's cavities. And then the other thing is that if you didn't get the proper contrast and density, or you didn't properly process that film, then you're not going to be able to tell uh, if there's cavities. So they are not diagnostic. Um, we're going to be able to look at interproximal cavities, occlusal, buccal and lingual, root surface, recurrent, and rampant. Interproximal cavities are going to be cavities that form between two adjacent surfaces, so mesial and distals, right? Um, the interproximal caries typically are seen um, at or just below the contact point. This is important for remembering this because sometimes cervical burnout will make it look like the patient has cavities when in reality it's too low. So if you're seeing the cavity form at the CEJ, you might need to rethink whether or not it's a cavity. If you see it happening right below the contact point though, it could very well be a cavity. Typically we see it as kind of a triangular sort of shape. So you see the tooth, right? And then you'll see, uh, well, let's look, let, let me try to draw the dentin, okay. Okay, this isn't looking terrible. So here you're going to see kind of, let me get to choose a new color. You're going to see this sort of uh, triangular shape as it barrels through the enamel. And then here you're going to see it kind of continue through as well. Um, once it reaches the dentino-enamel junction, it will spread laterally and progress through the dentin. These are classified as incipient, moderate, advanced, or severe. I think actually you see it more like this shape. I think I drew, I totally drew it wrong. So you're going to see it more like this shape. Jeez. <laughs> uh, so cavities are going to be classified as incipient, moderate, advanced, or severe. Interproximal cavities, uh, we can see them here. I'm definitely seeing something going on right here. Interproximal caries, so just below this contact here, we can see this sort of triangular shape right there. Same thing on this side, just below the contact, we see this triangular shape. Same thing up here. Um, and then here is um, this image, I guess, is just showing you where the contact point is. Incipient, uh, in this one, it is going to be not quite halfway through the thickness of the enamel. So if it's less than halfway, it's still considered incipient. Incipient is one of the, well, it's the only type of cavity that can be treated, um, successfully arrested with fluoride and prevention. Um, but once it's past incipient, it's no longer, it's no longer a thing a hygienist can deal with. Moderate interproximal caries, so this one will, uh, it will go more than halfway through the enamel, but it won't quite involve the dentino enamel junction just yet. Advanced, so this one is traveling through the, um, completely through the enamel, and it is traveling into the dentin, but it's not more than halfway towards the pulp, is going to be an advanced carious lesion. Severe carious lesion or uh, severe interproximal caries is going to be when it is past the enamel, is into the dentin, and it is more than halfway toward the pulp. 
a lot of the times once it hits this line, the dentist will say that that patient needs a root canal. Occlusal caries are cavities that involve the chewing surface of the posterior teeth, right? Because the uh, anterior don't, teeth don't have occlusal surfaces. They have an incisal. Anyway, uh, the early occlusal caries are difficult to see on a dental image. So incipient dental caries, this is something that you have to detect with an explorer. You can't see it on the x-ray. Moderate occlusal caries, so with this one, you will begin to see it on the x-ray. It's going to look like a very thin radiolucent line right below the enamel on the uh, image there. Severe occlusal caries, this is going to be like all the way into the dentin, more than halfway towards the pulp. Buccal and lingual, so it's going to look kind of like a, a little, like, uh, bubble on the side of the tooth. Um, and you can tell it's buccal lingual if you took an extra or a second um, x-ray of it, although you'll also be able to use your explorer to find out which, which surface it's on. Root surface caries. So this is typically seen when there is um, some type of bone loss and recession, more so than when you don't see it with recession. Uh, but in this image, you can see that just below the CEJ, uh, there is a little radiolucent area. Recurrent caries, this is what happens when you have a filling material and then you have a big radiolucent area right below the filling material. Rampant caries is when there are severe caries that affect uh, a number of teeth. It's not just in one tooth. Um, they're typically associated with poor diets um, and decreased salivary flow. Uh, also, you probably would think of it like um, someone who has like mucositis or something. They, they could very well end up with rampant caries. Um, Conditions resembling caries, so you don't want to confuse these things, but it's going to be cervical burnout, restorative materials, uh, like certain types of composite, um, attrition and abrasion. Cervical burnout is the radiolucent artifact that is seen on dental images. Um, it looks kind of like a collar shaped or a wedge shaped area between the CEJ and the alveolar bone, uh, and you don't so this is what I was talking about earlier. If it's too close to the line of the bone, it's gonna be cervical burnout. Um, and the main reason for this is kind of the shape of the teeth. Um, because teeth have kind of like that neck sort of shape, that is why you see cervical burnout. Uh, but cavities are usually seen right below the contact area. This is what that cervical burnout looks like because the teeth have like a sort of neck shape here. Um, this is not a cavity. Same thing here. Um, so because there is like that, you know, mesial and distal concavity that we see here, right? That is why it looks like there is a cervical burnout on the tooth. Restorative materials like composites, silicates, and acrylics, um, they're typically just not as dense as the teeth, and so they appear uh, radiolucent. That is what that looks like. Mechanical um, attrition is the mechanical wearing down of teeth, and it can be seen on the incisal or the occlusal surfaces of either deciduous teeth or permanent teeth, um, and it just depends on where you see it, uh, but this is what that looks like. Abrasion is the wearing away of the tooth structure from the friction of a foreign object. Most of the time we see this with toothbrushing, um, with like the horizontal scrub uh, technique of toothbrushing, although sometimes you see it with patients who use toothpicks. And that is what that looks like. Disruption, uh, or I'm sorry, description of the periodontium. So we have the lamina dura, which appears as the dense radiopaque line in healthy teeth. And then we have alveolar crest, uh, which will always be about one and a half to two millimeters below the CEJ, or I'm sorry, apical, if you're talking about top teeth, right? Um, so in the anterior, the crest is pointed. In the posterior, it should be flat. And it's a little less radiopaque than uh, in the back or uh, around posterior teeth than it is around the anterior teeth. Um, so this is what healthy bone looks like. Um, you'll see kind of a little bit of sort of a, a fuzziness to it, but no bone loss, right? Um, so this, again, 
is kind of a healthier uh, alveolar crest. Um, a little bit of like fuzziness here, right? But no loss. We're still seeing one to two millimeters below the CEJ. So periodontal disease is going to be, uh, your book isn't actually up to date on periodontal disease. It's still using the um, like the 1999 version of periodontal uh, classifications, but we're going to go through each one of them. So um, the image appearance is going to be, uh, it says, appears indistinct. Um, so they lost the bone here. And you can see this area, you can see this furcation area here, and you can see this area where they have lost bone. The horizontal bite wing has limited value in the detection of periodontal disease. Um, severe interproximal bone loss cannot be adequately visualized on horizontal bite wing images. So if for severe interproximal bone loss, you'd have to use vertical, bone, vertical bite wings or use PAs in order to determine where that bone level is. The panoramic image also very little diagnostic value. There's, you can't, you can't tell. Um, so here's what that might look like. Uh, you can use vertical bite wings or um, PAs, and you can see where that bone level is sitting. Bone loss is estimated as the difference between the physiologic bone level and the height of the remaining bone. It can be described in terms of the pattern, the distribution, and the severity of the bone loss. So this is what that looks like. Uh, there is the physiologic level of bone, where the bone is supposed to be, versus where the bone is. Or you can describe it by pattern. So you can say that it had, there's horizontal bone loss there, um, or there is vertical bone loss. This is what that looks like, horizontal bone loss. You can see as it travels directly across, and there's a, an even amount of bone loss kind of um, through that section. Whereas vertical bone loss looks more like this, where there is going to be a line that clearly uh, is an oblique sort of line. Then there's the distribution. So here you should be marking whether it is localized or it's generalized. We say localized if it affects less than one third of the mouth. Once it goes more than a third, then it becomes generalized. So here, you can see bone loss everywhere. That's generalized. Severity, so here we can talk about slight bone loss, one to two millimeters, moderate three to four, severe five or greater. And this is always measured by clinical attachment loss. We know we can calculate clinical attachment loss by understanding clinical attachment level. This is the old uh, case type, right, from 1999. So this isn't the new one. However, they are still using this for insurance, but they will not be using this for your board exams. Your board exams will use the 2018 classifications for, uh, uh, for bone loss. So you need to understand stage and grade. We're, I'm going to just kind of click through all of these because you, you, you shouldn't be messing with this. Um, so here we, I'm just going to keep going. Okay, so predisposing factors and local irritants that contribute to periodontal disease. There is elimination of the management um, of these contributing factors. So if there's something causing the bone loss, eliminating that cause is going to be important in managing the disease. Um, that would be like, you know, if there's an overhang causing, you know, calculus to build up and it's causing bone loss, then that would be like removing the calculus but not fixing the overhang. It doesn't just doesn't make any sense. Fix the things that are causing the problem. Um, so in uh, dental aid, dental images aid in detection of irritants like calculus and defective restorations. Calculus looks like this on the x-ray. It's going to appear white or light, as if there was like a little spur hanging off the side of the tooth. Uh, it is the most often appears as pointed or irregular, um, extending from those proximal surfaces. Although sometimes you can see kind of like a ring-like shape, which I can see a little bit right here. There's like this like ring sort of shape here. Um, it can also have a nodular appearance projection or even a smooth opacity along a root surface. This again is calculus. This is kind of like that smooth surface. You can see that there's just like a whole sheet of calculus right here. 
same thing here. There is a, uh, a lot of calculus right along this surface here. And then here you can see kind of like a little bump and then a big bump. And then there's all that. That, that would be so much fun to clean. Again, you can see calculus. This calculus is below the, um, the crown here. So there's a good chance that whoever was cleaning this person's teeth, um, you know, if, if they've had their teeth cleaned in a while, which is, is a little doubtful, but um, you know, last time they had their teeth cleaned, it's possible to leave a little bit of calculus below this restoration. Um, that's why it's important when you are trying to figure out about whether it's calculus or whether it's a restoration that you kind of move up and down um, against the tooth to figure out are you uh, bumping both directions or are you like kind of just falling in because if you if you as you're moving apical if you sort of just fall in and then it goes down smooth then it's a restoration um, whereas if when you're kind of moving apical if you bump over it then it's calculus Defective restorations um, are going to act as food traps and they can lead to the accumulation of debris and bacteria. Um, and then they can activate the site that is going to create clinical attachment loss. Uh, dental images can allow the identification of certain restorations that have open or light contacts. Um, if there is a poor contour on uneven marginal ridges, overhangs or inadequate margins. This is what that would look like. So this tooth is not meant to be shaped um, like a trapezoid. OK, teeth, teeth aren't supposed to be shaped that way. Teeth are supposed to have curves because they want the food uh, whenever, you know, the the you know, you're chewing up your food. You want it to kind of glance off to the side so it doesn't damage this tissue around the neck of the tooth. Again, defective restoration. So this area is definitely going to trap uh, bacteria down underneath that overhang. More defective restorations, definitely trapping uh, bacteria. It looks like someone tried to clean out this section. All right, for the very last slide, we're gonna go through and figure out what these restorative materials are. Uh, so in this one, I'm seeing what I would guess is amalgam. This right here is a root canal. This is definitely a crown. Um, I would go out on a limb and say that that's probably a gold crown because I'm not seeing any porcelain around the edges, but you know, I'm not 100% sure of that. This right here, definitely amalgam. Same thing here, definitely amalgam. Definitely amalgam. I mean, there's a possibility that this is gold foil, but that's kind of unlikely. And then here we see the three unit bridge. Let me just erase these. Um, next up is decay, whether there is any decay present. So uh, while it might be tempting to come in and say that this is decay, that would definitely not be. Uh, that is definitely cervical burnout. I'm seeing a lot of cervical burnout here. Uh, that spot right there, I would probably say is more like a lining. I don't necessarily think that that's a cavity. Uh, this little area right here is a little suspicious, although it might just be a poor margin. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't think that there's any cavity um, here in image A, uh, but you'll have to get with Miss Janice to see um, what the the book says that there is, because uh, there might be. And then three uh, is the periodontal AAP classification. So according to the new staging and grading, um, let's see. So I can see that there is a little bit of bone loss right here. I'm seeing like a vertical line there. And the enamel ends right here. Typically, I want to see the bone right here. And I definitely see maybe one, uh, one millimeter, most two millimeters there definitely seeing bone loss right here although i don't know what's causing that it could have been a third uh well a second molar <laughs> that would have could have caused it although it does look like this tooth is missing this tooth is missing um if these two teeth were lost due to bone level right like let's say it comes up here and then it totally lost this tooth um then that would make this person automatically a stage three but because I don't know and I can't ask this person this question, I'm going to go ahead and say that I think this person is a stage one. Uh, I know nothing about whether this person smokes or is diabetic or anything like that. So I can't grade the individual. But um, that's this is this is what I'm going to guess. 
All right, number two, let me choose a different color. Um, so restorations here, I'm seeing uh, this, which I think is probably an amalgam. Um, I don't see any other restorations here. Uh, I mean, there's still, there still might be like a, a composite or something, but I don't see one. Uh, decay present, so I am seeing decay present here. This is going to be um, an advanced um, or I'm sorry, a severe carious lesion because it is past the dentin and more than halfway towards the pulp cavity. Typically when you see a cavity like this against one tooth, there's also a cavity here against this tooth, which I think I'm seeing, which uh, because it's more than halfway through the dentin, this is no longer uh, incipient. I think this is a, uh, a moderate carious lesion. Uh, I don't love the, the contrast here. This is hard to tell. Uh, I think I'm seeing something here, although I'm not 100% sure. I wish I could see this better. Um, then last but not least, let's go back to the other color and the AAP for this one. I'm probably going to call this person, um, you know, either healthy or gingivitis. I can't tell because um, I can't see their tissue, but I do know that they don't have enough bone loss for me to uh, stage them. So that would be my guess. All right, but that's the end of the radiology portions. Um, you know, we made it through both theory and the, um, the anatomy. Yes, it is a bit longer. It's a very important topic when it comes to taking your board exams. Um, you will 100% see questions like this on your board. And um, I know that it's a lot of material, but, um, but I know you can do it. And, and if you need anything, you know that you can reach out to me.